Welcome to Ahmed's World Time Trek. Today, we embark on a captivating journey through history as we explore one of the most remarkable military campaigns of all time, Napoleon's Italian Campaign. Join us as we uncover the strategic brilliance, tactical mastery, and unwavering determination that propelled Napoleon to victory against the Austrian armies. From the iconic battles of Montenat and Lodi to the decisive moments at Castiglione and Rivoli, prepare to witness the rise of a military legend. Get ready for an unforgettable adventure as we unravel the secrets behind Napoleon's triumph in Italy. During the Italian campaign, Austria was Napoleon's main enemy. However, he was able to take advantage of moments when the Austrians were not posing an immediate threat to protect his rear. While there are accounts suggesting that French troops arriving in the Papal States in June 1796 lit their pipes with altar candles, this vivid image is often considered to be exaggerated and potentially propagandistic. Pope Pius VI had denounced the French Revolution and supported the First Coalition against France, although he did not formally join it. As a result, Napoleon saw the Pope's actions as an insult and sought retribution. The 78-year-old Pope, who had already been reigning for 21 years, lacked the military and personal capacity to prevent Napoleon's advance. Napoleon entered Medina on June 18 and Bologna the next day, expelling the papal authorities and forcing them to negotiate within a week. In late June, Napoleon agreed to an armistice with the Pope, which included a financial contribution of 15 million francs. The payment helped sway the French Directory toward the idea of a peace treaty. Additionally, negotiations led to the transfer of various artworks and manuscripts from the Vatican Library to the French, including sculptures of Junius Brutus and Marcus Brutus, as well as 500 manuscripts. On August 11th, Napoleon noticed that the Vatican Library was trying to reduce its commitment, and he wrote to the French agent in Rome emphasizing that the treaty included 500 manuscripts, not 300. During this time, Napoleon expressed concerns to the Directory about the limited size of his army and the challenges of managing various cities and regions in Italy. He stressed the need to maintain control, protect the rear, and deter potential uprisings. Napoleon recognized that his seeming invincibility played a significant role in keeping the Italian cities in check, as much as the actual military force he commanded. Nevertheless, he was aware of the vulnerability to a coordinated revolt. Napoleon employed a strategic mix of threats and indifference in his Italian statecraft. He emphasized the importance of instilling terror in some areas while pretending not to notice in others, waiting for the right time to take action. He appealed to the pride of those he aimed to conquer while making it clear that resistance would have severe consequences. His proclamations to the Tyrolese, for example, conveyed both respect for the local population and a warning of the French army's potential wrath. While Napoleon relied heavily on his trusted aide Louis Alexander Berthier, he also asserted his own capabilities. He dismissed rumors that suggested Berthier was solely responsible for his success, emphasizing that Berthier was not capable of commanding a battalion. However, it is worth noting that Napoleon later entrusted significant commands to Berthier, indicating that his initial statement was likely driven by concerns about public perception. The British, who had previously engaged in trade with the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, were expelled from Livorno on June 27, and their merchandise valued at £12 million was seized. The Milan Citadel fell after a 48-hour bombardment on June 29. In response, when the British seized the island of Elba on July 11, Napoleon acknowledged that they were merely following the example set by the French in violating neutrality. Napoleon also obtained a financial contribution from Grand Duke Ferdinand III of Tuscany, the younger brother of Emperor Francis, who had granted trading privileges to English merchants in Livorno. During his visit to Florence on July 1, Napoleon was greeted by a large crowd eager to catch a glimpse of him. He met with Grand Duke Ferdinand at the Baboli Gardens and observed the magnificent artworks commissioned by the Medici, including ceiling paintings by Pietro de Cortona, as well as paintings by renowned artists such as Rubens, Raphael, Titian, Van Dyck, and Rembrandt. Napoleon informed the Grand Duke that his brother no longer held any land in Lombardy, although Mantua was still under Austrian control. Ferdinand, while composed outwardly, understood that the fall of Mantua would likely lead to the loss of his throne. On June 26, Josephine left Paris for Milan accompanied by various individuals, including Joseph Bonaparte, her companion Louise Compoint, Joseph's brother-in-law Nicolas Clary, financier Antoine Hamelin, Junot, four servants, a cavalry escort, and Josephine's dog Fortune. During the journey, Junot seduced Louise, which led Josephine to dismiss her upon reaching Milan, creating enmity between Josephine and Junot. 
Two years later, Josephine would deeply regret this decision. During Josephine's journey, Napoleon sent her passionate love letters filled with expressions of longing and desire. He expressed his eagerness to be in her arms and declared his love for her. Napoleon admitted to having other letters that he considered too foolish to send. Despite Josephine's potential affairs in Paris, Napoleon professed his unwavering love for her, stating that he would love her even more despite any perceived betrayals. Josephine arrived at the Serbaloni Palace in Milan on July 10, and three days later, Napoleon joined her after an eventful march through various Italian cities. He had amassed significant wealth through forced contributions and established control over central Italy. Napoleon seemed unaware of the presence of Hippolyte Charles, and Josephine responded warmly to Napoleon's affection, despite her emotional state. According to Hamelin, Napoleon would often play with Josephine, teasing her and causing her to cry out, even resorting to rough caresses that would prompt Hamelin to look out the window to distract himself. Their relationship was characterized by physical touch, and observers noted Josephine's modesty and engaging personality. She frequently wept for trivial reasons. Napoleon had summoned Joseph to be near him and entrusted him with confidential negotiations. Joseph, with the rank of Commissary General, was to undertake missions to Livorno, Parma, and Rome, displaying a talent for diplomacy during these assignments. He later accompanied Maya de Melito to regain French control over Corsica. Napoleon's stay in Milan was brief as he needed to confront Wormser's approaching army of 50,000 men and capture Mantua, from Beaulieu before the city could be relieved. He proposed a bold plan to the Directory, involving Marat's covert crossing of the lakes protecting Mantua in Austrian uniforms to open the city gates for Napoleon's troops. However, the plan was foiled by an unexpected drop in the water level, preventing its execution. In late July, Napoleon received intelligence from a paid informer about General Wormser's movements. Wormser was leading his army, which now included experienced veteran units from the Rhine campaign, to relieve the garrison in Mantua. Napoleon placed great importance on gathering intelligence and personally analyzed the information instead of relying on staff officers. He employed various methods to gather intelligence, such as interrogating deserters and prisoners, sending out cavalry patrols, and disguising soldiers as farm laborers to extract information from locals. The spies' information proved to be accurate, as Wormser was advancing with 32,000 men on the eastern side of Lake Garda, while General Kostanovich was approaching with 18,000 men on the western side. Napoleon left General Serrier with a portion of the army to maintain the siege of Mantua, while he gathered 31,000 men to counter the new threats. He distributed his forces strategically, deploying different generals and divisions to various locations to slow down and engage the enemy. Napoleon personally moved between several locations, including Brescia, Castelnuovo, Di Senzano, Roverbella, Castiglione, Goito, and Peschiera, setting up his mobile headquarters wherever it provided the best view of the campaign's progress. His constant activity in the sweltering heat led to the exhaustion of several horses. Despite the challenging conditions, Napoleon remained actively involved, closely monitoring the situation and issuing orders. On July 29, as anticipated, Kostanovich pushed General Soret out of Salo, although the town changed hands multiple times. On the same day, Messina was attacked at La Corona and Rivoli and had to conduct a fighting retreat down the Adige River to Basilengo. The Austrians made advances and captured Rivoli. Napoleon reassured Messina, expressing confidence that they would recover the lost ground with courage. However, on July 30, the Austrians executed a successful surprise attack on Brescia, capturing the city's garrison and hospitals with minimal casualties. Among the wounded and captured were Morat, Lons, and Kellerman's son François Etienne. Josephine, who had traveled to Brescia from Milan at Napoleon's request, was nearly captured, intensifying Napoleon's determination to make Wormser pay for the losses. Napoleon acknowledged the setbacks in his correspondence with the Directory, and ordered non-essential equipment to be sent to the rear. On July 29, he initially believed that the enemy was descending from Bassano and concentrated his forces at Villanova, east of Verona. However, by the next day, he realized that the main enemy force was to the north and west. Recognizing that facing Wormser's main advance without achieving a decisive victory would result in losing Mantua, Napoleon decided to deal with Kostanovich first. He ordered Serrier to abandon the siege of Mantua, allowing him to increase the numbers in the field by incorporating General Pelletier's brigade into Augereau's force and Dalamain's brigade into Messina's. Napoleon directed Augereau to retreat to Roverbella and personally joined him there. Augereau wasted no time in executing the retreat as ordered by Napoleon. Overall, Napoleon faced setbacks and had to adjust his strategy to counter the advancing Austrian forces. His ability to gather and analyze intelligence played a crucial role in his decision-making process during the campaign. 
Ending the siege of Mantua involved abandoning 179 cannons and mortars that couldn't be removed, as well as dumping their ammunition in the lakes. Although it pained Napoleon to do so, he believed that decisive victories on the battlefield were more important than fortresses in modern warfare. He was determined to achieve a swift victory and told Messina, whatever happens, and however much it costs, we must sleep in Brescia tomorrow. On the 31st of July, the French army marched westward at 3 a.m., and a fierce battle ensued at dawn for the town of Lonato between General Soret and Austrian General Ott. The fighting lasted for four hours, and despite being heavily outnumbered, Ott eventually fell back. With the arrival of General Augereau's forces, the 18,000 men under Kostanovich faced a French army of 30,000. Realizing the unfavorable odds, Kostanovich promptly retreated. Concerned about the security of his lines of communication, Napoleon marched with Augereau to Brescia that night, reaching the city by the next morning. Wormser, who was confused by conflicting reports of Napoleon's movements, lost the initiative through inaction. General Antoine Lavalette's panic and flight from Castiglione resulted in him being stripped of his command in front of his men. The troops' enthusiasm that day convinced Napoleon to attempt to crush Kostanovich. On August 3, at the Second Battle of Lonato, Napoleon sent Despinoe's force from Brescia to turn Kostanovich's right flank at Govardo, while Soret attacked his left flank at Salo with Dalamane's brigade marching between them. Napoleon assured Soret's hungry men that they could find food in the enemy camp. As Pigeon's brigade was being driven from Lonato, Napoleon arrived with elements of Messina's division. He ordered the 32nd Line Demi Brigade into a bayonet charge, supported by the 18th Line. Despite losing both battalion commanders, they pushed the Austrians back towards Di Senzano, where they encountered Napoleon's cavalry and accepted defeat. Kostanovich retreated around the north side of the lake to rejoin Wormser. Augaro successfully recaptured Castiglione on August 3 after 16 hours of intense fighting. Napoleon recognized Augaro's crucial role in the battle, and for years afterward, he would defend Augaro against criticism by saying, Ah, but let us not forget that he saved us at Castiglione. By the time the French regrouped at Castiglione on August 4, Wormser had lost his opportunity to attack Napoleon's rear. His only hope was to buy time for Mantua to prepare for another siege. On that morning, Napoleon employed a ruse at Lonato, bluffing a group of over 3,000 lost Austrians who had been cut off from Kostanovich's command. He claimed that his whole army was present and threatened their surrender. The Austrians fell for the deception and surrendered, only realizing afterward that there were no French forces nearby and that they could have easily captured Napoleon. Napoleon's swift and decisive actions during these battles helped him secure victories and maintain the upper hand against the Austrian forces. The Second Battle of Lonato marked the first successful use of the battalion care system by Napoleon. This formation, proposed by Guibert and Bourset in the 1760s and 1770s, provided increased flexibility and adaptability on the battlefield. Under this system, the army was organized into a diamond-shaped formation of units. When encountering the main body of the enemy, the division on the right flank became the new advance guard, while the divisions that had formed the old vanguard and rear guard became the master maneuver, the central strike force capable of supporting the new advance division and enveloping the enemy's flanks. This allowed the army to change direction easily and adjust the battlefront according to changing circumstances. Napoleon employed the battalion care formation again at the Second Battle of Castiglione, which took place 20 miles northwest of Mantua on August 5th. Facing Wormser's Austrian forces, Napoleon had over 30,000 men at his disposal. Messina's division was positioned on the left, Augaro's forces were in front of Castiglione, Kilmaine's cavalry acted as reserves on the right, and other units were strategically placed. Napoleon planned to draw Wormser's reserves northwards by feigning a withdrawal. The battle commenced with fighting along the entire line. Augaro captured Solferino, Despinoe arrived to support the left center, and Marmont led a battery towards Monte Metellano. Wormser found himself trapped between two French armies, with a third threatening his rear. Forced to withdraw, he narrowly escaped capture by French light cavalry. The Austrian army suffered heavy losses, with 2,000 killed and wounded, 1,000 captured, and the loss of 20 guns. The French had around 1,100 casualties. Following the victory, Napoleon reported to the Directory, the governing body of France at the time, stating that the campaign had been completed in five days. He resumed the siege of Mantua on August 10th, with the city still holding a significant Austrian garrison. During the remaining weeks of August, Napoleon used the time to refit his army and replaced wounded generals. He also faced domestic issues such as trying to locate his wife, Josephine, and dealing with the actions of his brother Lucien, when he left for Paris and did not return to his duty at Marseilles, and be sent to the Army of the North within 24 hours of his being found. However, 
His growing reputation and success on the battlefield diminished interference from the Directory regarding his military decisions. In late August, Napoleon received information that Wormser was planning a second attempt to relieve Mantua. Napoleon gathered a total of over 50,000 troops by combing out his lines of communication and receiving reinforcements from the Army of the Alps. To counter Wormser's potential routes, Napoleon deployed Voboy with 11,000 men to block the west side of Lake Garda, while Messina with 13,000 men and Augaro with 9,000 men were stationed at Rivoli and Verona, respectively, forming his central strike force. Kilmaine guarded the eastern approaches with 1,200 infantry and most of the cavalry. Napoleon himself stayed with a 3,500-man reserve at Legnago, while Sahagwet besieged Mantua with 10,000 men and another 6,000 troops watched for rebellions around Cremona. By September 2, Napoleon confirmed that Wormser was advancing through the Valagarina Valley of the Adige. Napoleon planned to attack once he received news that General Moreau, leading the Army of Germany, had arrived at Innsbruck. However, Moreau faced setbacks in Germany, with Archduke Charles defeating General Jordan at Würzburg on September 3rd and Moreau raiding Munich, making their assistance unavailable. Napoleon had to guard against the risk of being forced to face both Archduke Charles's and Wormser's armies simultaneously, which he lacked the manpower to do. Napoleon advanced to Rovereto, near Trento, and intercepted Wormser's advance guard on September 4th. The French faced strong Austrian defenses at the defile of Marco, but Pigeon's light infantry managed to gain the heights and after a stubborn resistance, the Austrian line broke. The French suffered around 750 casualties, while the Austrians lost 3,000 men, mostly captured, 25 guns, and 7 colors. With the Austrian army retreating, four more battles took place in the same valley over the following week. At Caliano, the French surprised the Austrian forces during breakfast and forced them out of their positions. On September 7, the French attacked and captured a seemingly impregnable position at Primolano through sheer determination. The valley's narrow U-shape with high cliffs on both sides should have favored the Austrians, but French light infantry swarmed up the mountains, crossed the fast-flowing Brenta River, and charged the Austrians, causing them to flee to Bassano. That night, Napoleon slept with Augereau's division, sharing their rations and resting under the stars, as he often did in his early campaigns. The next day, the French captured 2,000 Austrians and 30 guns at Bassano along with ammunition wagons. Messina suffered a minor defeat at Syria on the 11th with around 400 French casualties when he overextended in pursuit of the enemy. On the following day, Augaro captured Legnago and 22 Austrian guns without any losses, freeing 500 French prisoners of war. Finally, on September 15th at La Favorita, outside Mantua, Kilmaine dealt a defeat to Wormser, forcing the Austrian commander-in-chief to retreat into the city. In late September, Napoleon returned to Milan with Josephine and remained there for nearly a month. During this time, he sent General Marmont to Paris with 22 captured Austrian standards, which served as a powerful propaganda tool and were displayed at less invalids. The speed and momentum of Napoleon's operations allowed him to maintain the initiative, swiftly advancing through the narrow valley gorge where the Austrians should have been able to impede his progress. This lightning campaign in the Brenta Valley demonstrated the value of esprit de corps, as Napoleon utilized his knowledge of the Italian language to gather information from locals and employed the battalion care system, enabling his army to move in any direction at a moment's notice. He effectively divided the Austrian army at Rovereto, forcing its separate parts to retreat and be defeated in classic maneuvering from a central position. Napoleon continued to apply pressure on Wormser, launching regular dawn attacks. At the start of the campaign, Wormser commanded 20,000 men with a three-day head start. However, by the end, his force had dwindled to 14,000 as they joined the 16,000 troops already trapped in Mantua. By October 10, Mantua was fully under siege once again, with Wormser and his men inside. The conditions within the city were dire, with 4,000 soldiers succumbing to wounds, malnutrition, and disease in just six weeks. An additional 7,000 were hospitalized. With only 38 days' worth of food remaining, Wormser was forced to conduct sorties for supplies, resulting in significant casualties. Although Mantua's defenses were weakening, the broader state of the war did not bode well for Napoleon's chances of capturing the city. Archduke Charles had repelled General Jordan's forces across the Rhine on September 21, and it seemed likely that the Austrians would soon launch a third attempt to relieve Mantua, this time with a larger force. Napoleon requested 25,000 reinforcements from the Directory in anticipation of potential hostilities with the Papal States and Naples. He also made overtures for peace with Emperor Francis of Austria on October 2, emphasizing the desire for an end to the war and warning of potential actions such as the closure of Trieste and other Austrian ports along the Adriatic. 
however, he received no response to his peace offer. On October 8, Napoleon threatened to resign, citing exhaustion and physical limitations. He expressed his belief that Mantua could not be taken before February and raised concerns about Rome's arming and the influence of the Vatican. He demanded the right to sign a final treaty with Naples and sought alliances with Genoa and Piedmont, highlighting the risks involved when he was not at the center of decision-making. Two days later, without prior approval from the Directory, Napoleon signed a comprehensive peace treaty with Naples, allowing the Bourbon dynasty to retain their throne as long as they refrained from acting against the French. This move aimed to secure his southern flank in case of an Austrian invasion from the north. Additionally, Napoleon ensured that his lines of communication ran through Genoa, a more reliable ally, rather than Piedmont, whose newly crowned king, Charles Emmanuel IV, was an unknown factor. In October 1796, Napoleon faced criticism and rumors in Paris about his ambitions and potential to overthrow the government. Despite ridiculing his detractors in letters to the Directory, they remained wary of his growing popularity and how he might use it once the Italian campaign concluded. During this time, Napoleon was primarily concerned with the untrustworthiness of army contractors, whom he regarded as swindlers, particularly the influential company Flatchett. On October 16, Napoleon made an unsuccessful attempt to convince Wormser to surrender Mantua, emphasizing that the brave should face danger, not succumb to disease. On the same day, without significant input from the Directory, he declared the establishment of the Cispidane Republic, comprising Bologna, Ferrara, Medina, and Reggio. This newly formed republic abolished feudalism, established civil equality, and initiated a popularly elected assembly. It marked the beginning of the Risorgimento, a movement for Italian unification that would ultimately lead to the creation of a unified, independent Italy many decades later. However, Napoleon faced resistance in his efforts to diminish the power of the Roman Catholic Church in Italy. The Italians vehemently opposed his religious reforms, and his attempts to exert control over the Vatican were met with opposition. Despite his warning to Pius VI not to oppose the Cispidane Republic, Napoleon acknowledged that destroying the temporal power of the Pope would require more than just willpower, and suggested that arrangements could be made during peacetime. He cautioned the Pope against declaring war, predicting dire consequences for anyone who opposed the Republican forces. In early November, the Austrians prepared for their third attempt to relieve Mantua. General Josef Alvinci led a main force of 28,000 men, while General Giovanni di Provera and another contingent were assigned diversionary roles. The Austrian plan, devised by the Aulic Council in Vienna, demonstrated a lack of strategic understanding, as it allocated a significant number of troops for diversionary attacks rather than concentrating forces effectively. Napoleon later commended Alvinci as the best general he had faced thus far, refraining from making positive or negative comments about him in his bulletins. He also showed respect for General Provera, considering him the least capable of the Austrian commanders and hoping he would not be dismissed. On the night of November 14, Messina left Verona and headed west to deceive Austrian spies in the city. However, he then changed direction and moved southeast to join Augaro on the designated road. Meanwhile, Napoleon had devised a bold plan to outmaneuver Alvinci's forces. Instead of opting for the easier crossing of the Adige River at Alberidu, where the Austrian cavalry could detect their movement, Napoleon chose to cross at Ronco. Although the pontoon bridge had been dismantled, it was stored nearby and could be quickly reassembled. Napoleon's intention was to position his forces behind Alvinci at Villanova, forcing the Austrians to fight for their line of retreat in a region inundated with rice fields. The marshy terrain would negate the advantage of Alvinci's larger numbers. The plan relied on the element of surprise and swift execution. On November 15, Messina and Augaro successfully rendezvoused, and their combined forces advanced towards Ronco to cross the Adige River. However, the weather worsened, with heavy rain and muddy conditions hampering their progress. The soldiers struggled with slipping in the mud, and the rain washed away gunpowder, further impeding their attacks. The French attacks throughout the morning made limited gains, but once Austrian reinforcements arrived at 3 p.m., the situation shifted against Napoleon's forces. Both sides suffered approximately 1,000 casualties in the engagement. Napoleon, although claiming it as a victory, did not order a medal to commemorate the Battle of Caldero, indicating that he did not consider it a significant achievement. Following the battle, both armies took a day of rest on November 13. Napoleon utilized this time to write a letter to the Directory in which he expressed despair and frustration, seemingly blaming them for the difficulties he faced in Italy. He highlighted the lack of reinforcements and supplies and the exhaustion and poor condition of his troops. However, he also expressed determination to make one last effort and capture Mantua, indicating his hope for a favorable outcome. 
Despite the setbacks and challenges, Napoleon remained resolute in his pursuit of victory in Italy. The next phase of the campaign would test his strategic ingenuity and the resilience of his forces. Napoleon executed a clever crossing of the Adige River near Arcol, using causeways to stealthily build a pontoon bridge under cover of darkness. Messina secured the left flank while Augaro encountered resistance from Croat troops protecting Alvinci's rear on the right. At Arcol, repeated assaults to take the crucial bridgehead failed against heavy fire. Napoleon and Augaro boldly led charges but were repulsed with heavy losses. Napoleon had to withdraw south of the river under an Austrian counterattack. Over the next two days, fighting continued around Arcole as Alvinci brought reinforcements. Messina and Augaro eventually succeeded in retaking the bridge on the 17th. Though costly for both sides, Arcole was a tactical victory for Napoleon that checked Alvinci's efforts to relieve Mantua. With winter setting in, both armies suffered from casualties, hunger, and lack of supplies. Napoleon dismissed underperforming officers and prepared to face an expected fourth Austrian attempt to break the siege of Mantua before its inevitable fall. His report painted a grim but hopeful picture of emerging victory after the hard-fought battles along the Adige. In summation, the Battle of Arcole saw Napoleon outmaneuver but nearly fall to Alvinci in brutal fighting to control the vital river crossing, before eventually prevailing through perseverance and flanking moves by his trusted divisional commanders Messina and Augaro. Napoleon's letter to Josephine on November 27, 1796, expressed his disappointment and frustration at her absence when he arrived in Milan. He accused her of prioritizing social events over their relationship and stated that he felt neglected and unhappy. However, Josephine was skilled at comforting Napoleon and alleviating his suspicions. According to Antoine Lavalette, a relative who served as one of Napoleon's aides-de-camp, Josephine would hold Napoleon in her lap after breakfast, providing him with affection and reassurance. During this period, Napoleon also wrote a letter to Jerome de Lalande, the director of the Paris Observatory, expressing his desire for happiness, which he described as spending nights with a beautiful woman and observing the night sky while engaging in scientific pursuits. Napoleon faced challenges on various fronts during this time. He received a complaint from Battaglia, the chief officer of neutral Venice, about the behavior of French troops in Venetian territory. Napoleon vehemently denied the allegations of rape and urged the Republic of Venice not to openly oppose France. After initially standing his ground, Battaglia retracted his complaint upon Napoleon's response. The British, led by Commodore Horatio Nelson, conducted a successful evacuation of Corsica after realizing they could no longer defend it against the French. Napoleon appointed Maya de Molito and Salicidi to organize the French departments in Corsica once the British departed. He also instructed Joseph to restore the Casa Bonaparte, their family home in Corsica, to its original condition before it was damaged during previous conflicts. The situation in Mantua was dire, with nearly 9,000 people succumbing to disease and starvation between September and December 1796. The garrison soldiers were dwindling in numbers and supplies were running out. Napoleon was concerned about an impending Austrian attack and sent numerous letters to Berthier, his chief of staff, requesting reinforcements from the directory. He even captured an Austrian spy who carried a letter for Emperor Francis in a cylinder concealed inside his body. Napoleon's attention to his soldiers' well-being was unwavering. He investigated reports of soldiers not presenting themselves to their quartermasters on payday, suspecting foul play. He also expressed his frustration with the administration of the Army of Italy, citing corruption and luxury among army contractors. While he requested the power to execute administrators, the directory did not grant him such authority. On January 7, 1797, Napoleon received news that General Alvinci was advancing south with 47,000 troops. The Austrian forces divided once again, with Alvinci's main force marching down the east side of Lake Garda, while Provera's troops moved across the plain towards Verona. Additional Austrian troops were stationed to the west of Lake Garda. Alvinci also ordered General Wormser to break out of Mantua and join their forces. Napoleon left Milan and made several visits to different locations in an attempt to understand Alvinci's intentions. He had 37,000 soldiers in the field, with an additional 8,500 troops under General Serrier engaged in the Siege of Mantua. On January 12, 1797, General Joubert reported an attack at La Corona, north of Rivoli, which failed due to the deep snow. Napoleon received the news and realized that the main Austrian offensive would come via Rivoli. He quickly rode to Rivoli from Verona and issued new orders. Joubert was instructed to hold Rivoli at all costs, while General Serrier sent reinforcements to Rivoli from the siege lines. Messina was directed to march his troops to Joubert's left, and Augaro was to delay Provera on the Adige while sending some troops to Rivoli. 
Napoleon expected to concentrate a significant force at Rivoli by noon on January 14. The French forces were strategically positioned, with Messina and Joubert holding the key positions. Alvinci, the Austrian general, failed to bring additional forces to Rivoli, and Napoleon saw an opportunity to launch a spoiling attack to concentrate Alvinci's attention. At 4 a.m. on January 14, General Vial's brigade launched an attack on San Giovanni and Gambrin, capturing the San Marco Chapel. Joubert attacked at Caprino and San Giovanni but faced superior numbers and was checked. The Austrians counterattacked, routing Vial's brigade. Messina's brigade was sent to rescue the center, and the fighting in the center continued for 10 hours. By 11 a.m., Lusignan arrived with reinforcements and threatened the French left rear near Afi. Napoleon was under pressure on his right flank and had only one brigade in reserve. However, he remained calm and focused. When Lusignan got behind him, Napoleon famously said, We have them now. He decided that the Austrians in the center were depleted and concentrated on countering the main threat from Kwastanovich, in the east. Napoleon thinned out Joubert's line and sent reinforcements to San Marco. The Austrian columns, covered by artillery, assaulted the gorge and reached the plateau but were met with canister shots from French artillery and bayonet charges from infantry columns. A lucky shot hitting an ammunition wagon caused significant damage to the Austrians, and Kwastanovich ordered the attack to be aborted. Napoleon then shifted his focus to the center, where the Austrians had little artillery or cavalry. The three Austrian columns were driven off the plateau, and Lusignan was checked upon his arrival. General Ray appeared to the rear of Lusignan, forcing him to retreat with only a small number of his troops. By 2 p.m., the Austrians were in full retreat, and the French pursuit was halted when news arrived that Provera was crossing the Adige towards Mantua. Messina was then sent to aid Augaro in preventing the relief of Mantua. At the Battle of Rivoli, Napoleon's losses were approximately 2,200 men killed and 1,000 captured. The Austrian casualties were much higher, with around 4,000 killed and wounded and 8,000 captured, along with 8 guns and 11 standards. Although Napoleon exaggerated the numbers in his correspondence, claiming 6,000 killed and wounded, 60 guns, and 24 standards, the victory was still impressive. Following the battle, General Provera arrived with a relief column of 4,700 men at La Favorita on January 15. However, he was caught between Messina and Augaro and eventually surrendered along with his entire force. In Mantua, the Austrian garrison, led by Wormser, surrendered on February 2 after enduring desperate conditions and food shortages. Approximately 16,300 Austrians had died in Mantua during the previous eight months. Wormser and 500 of his staff were allowed to march out with the honors of war and return to Austria, on the condition that they would not fight against France until a prisoner exchange took place. The rest of the captured Austrians went into captivity in France, where they were put to work in agriculture and construction projects. The fall of Mantua caused a sensation in Paris, and the news was celebrated with great fanfare. After the victory at Rivoli, Napoleon continued his military campaigns. He went on to Verona and then Bologna, where he punished the Papal States for their perceived support of Austria. He pressured the Vatican to cease its alliances with Austria and Naples, and he issued a proclamation stating that priests and monks who did not adhere to the principles of the New Testament would face harsher treatment. Napoleon's forces easily overpowered the troops of the Papal States at Castel Bolognese and captured the Papal garrison of Ancona. By February 17, the Pope sued for peace, and a treaty was signed at Tolentino. Under the treaty, the Pope ceded territories to France, closed ports to the British, and agreed to pay a significant sum of money and provide artworks as a contribution. Napoleon expressed his satisfaction with the outcome, stating that France would have control over beautiful regions in Italy, except for a few objects in Turin and Naples. In February 1797, the Army of Italy launched a news sheet called the Journal de Bonaparte et de Homs Vertu, which aimed to influence public opinion. Napoleon recognized the power of propaganda and actively participated in shaping the content of the publication. The journal included statements highlighting Napoleon's swift and decisive military actions, such as, Bonaparte flies like lightning and strikes like a thunderbolt. It also indirectly criticized the directory, France's governing body, with Napoleon's permission. Napoleon went on to establish two army news sheets, the Courrier de l'Armée d'Italie and La France Vue de l'Armée d'Italie, to keep his soldiers informed and ensure that the Italian campaign remained prominent in public consciousness. He appointed individuals with diverse political backgrounds to lead these publications, such as the ex-Jacobin Marc-Antoine Jolien and Michel Regnaud de Saint-Jean d'Angeli, a former parliamentarian. Their appointments demonstrated Napoleon's willingness to overlook past political differences in favor of talent. In Paris, Napoleon's victories were celebrated with dances, cantatas, banquets, 
and processions organized by his growing number of supporters. The Moniteur, a newspaper in Paris, extensively covered Napoleon's achievements, mentioning the Army of Italy more frequently than any other French military force. This led to resentment from the high commands of other armies, such as the Army of the Rhine and Moselle and the Army of the Sambre and Meuse, who felt overshadowed by the Army of Italy. By 1796, prints and engravings depicting Napoleon began to circulate, marking the beginning of his cult of personality. These artworks portrayed him in various ways, sometimes inaccurately, as artists did not necessarily have first-hand knowledge of his appearance. Napoleon recognized the propaganda value of these visual representations and authorized the production of commemorative medals. Following his victories, skilled engraver Vivant Denon designed some of the most notable medals, including the Montenot Medal, which depicted a bust of Napoleon on one side and the Genius of War on the other. Over 141 official medals were struck by 1815, commemorating battles, treaties, coronations, and other significant events associated with Napoleon's reign. These medals were widely distributed during official events and celebrations, contributing to the cult of personality that surrounded Napoleon. On Friday, March 10, 1797, Napoleon embarked on a risky expedition with only 40,000 men through the Tyrol to Klagenfurt and Leoben in Styria. His goal was to threaten Vienna and compel the Austrians to make peace. Napoleon's campaign was supported by a propaganda war against Austria, as he denounced Emperor Francis as the paid servant of the merchants of London and accused the British of enjoying the woes of the continent. The British government had provided Austria with a substantial loan. Napoleon achieved small victories against Archduke Charles at Valvasone on March 16, and his general Bernadotte captured a detachment of Austrians. Napoleon employed a technique called order mixed, which combined the firepower of a battalion in line with the attack weight of two battalions in column during river crossings. He belittled Archduke Charles and criticized his strategic abilities. Despite not engaging in a major battle with Archduke Charles, the Austrians, facing pressure from both Napoleon and Moreau's assault through Germany, accepted an armistice at Leoben on April 2, 1797. Napoleon had achieved remarkable success during the campaign, crossing mountains, defeating multiple Austrian armies, and inflicting significant casualties on the enemy. He had become famous across Europe and had outwitted renowned Austrian generals. Napoleon's success was attributed to his study of Italian history and geography, his willingness to experiment with different strategies, his meticulous logistics planning, and his ability to concentrate and lead his divisions effectively. The Army of Italy, under his command, overcame privations and displayed great morale under his leadership. Moral factors, according to Napoleon, accounted for three-quarters of success in war. Napoleon also had capable lieutenants, including Joubert, Messina, and Augaro, who made significant contributions to his victories. He promoted commanders based on their abilities, regardless of age or background. Former Army of Italy commanders found themselves promoted when Napoleon came to power. With numerous victories and the French Republic extending its influence over Italy, Napoleon had become the darling child of victory celebrated by the people of Paris. Napoleon's military philosophy emphasized the importance of maintaining strong esprit de corps among his soldiers. He understood that an army with high morale could achieve remarkable feats. To raise and sustain morale, Napoleon employed various methods. He encouraged soldiers to identify strongly with their regiments and allowed certain units to display their bravery on their colors. He understood the power of pride and recognition, giving regiments nicknames and creating symbols and ceremonies that instilled a sense of belonging. Napoleon also made himself accessible to his soldiers, listening to their petitions and granting requests whenever possible. He personally read letters from the ranks and settled matters swiftly. This approach helped him stay connected with the needs and concerns of his troops. He engaged with soldiers during marches, joked with them, and showed genuine interest in their experiences. These interactions fostered a sense of camaraderie and loyalty. Taking inspiration from ancient history, Napoleon employed plays, songs, proclamations, festivals, and symbols to motivate and inspire his soldiers. He understood the significance of small gestures and ensured that his men felt appreciated and valued. He also referred to the soldiers' roles in history, making them believe they were part of something grand and historic. During military reviews, Napoleon personally inquired about the soldiers' well-being, including their food, uniforms, health, and pay. He encouraged them to voice their complaints and assured them of his support. He particularly emphasized the importance of caring for wounded soldiers promptly, both for their recovery and for maintaining morale. Napoleon learned leadership lessons from Julius Caesar, including the practice of admonishing underperforming troops and praising exceptional ones. His addresses to the troops were posted on billboards and highlighted their victories and achievements. 
He used rhetoric inspired by the ancient world and made references to eagles and the honor they would receive from their families and communities. Efficient staff work and a remarkable memory allowed Napoleon to recognize soldiers he had encountered before, creating a sense of familiarity and personal connection. While he could be severe towards officers and officials, he maintained a kind and supportive demeanor towards the enlisted men. Overall, Napoleon's leadership style focused on instilling a sense of pride, belonging, and purpose among his soldiers. His attention to their needs, accessibility, and ability to inspire and motivate them played a crucial role in their loyalty and his military successes. Thank you for joining us on Ahmed's World Time Trek. We hope you enjoyed this immersive exploration of Napoleon's Italian campaign. Stay tuned for more exciting historical journeys as we continue to travel through time and uncover the fascinating stories that have shaped our world.